you giving, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in the business Not because they wanna do it, just because they heard it pays And who the fuck wants to be poor, no one, that's how we've been raised Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shit how you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Hey guys, I asked a great question on my Facebook profile page. Question is, name some of the worst mistakes you can make as a rookie entering the field of corrections. I asked this question about five hours ago. 111 comments. That's 111 comments from those with experience sharing their expertise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off some of these comments because there's great advice here. And hopefully if we're new to this profession, whether it's correctional officer, or even just a civilian staff member. There's stuff here that can apply to what you are going to be coming into. This is some great advice, and I really hope that we listen to what I'm going to provide when we come back from our sponsors. Now, guys, if you haven't, the show Tear Talks for you, brave men and women at work in corrections. So please, subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. That bell is going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the worst mistakes that you can make as a rookie. Entering the field of corrections. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it. It's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career gonna save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt, and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation, available now. Link in description. All right, guys, and we're back. So, guys, right off the bat, the first thing I'm going to say, because obviously a lot of people are going to touch on this in the comment, is listen to those with experience. Listen to people that have walked the walk. If you're an FTO, please make sure that those that you have that are being trained, you partner them with good senior officers who want to train. And again, if you're being trained, don't be resistant to the advice you're getting from experienced COs or experienced staff members. Listen to what they have to say. If you're resistant and you close yourself off, they're gonna deny you the knowledge of what experience can bring, which you're not gonna be able to get anywhere else. But if you accept it, if you're willing to learn, well, there's that great dance and it will motivate them to continue to give you that experience. And we don't wanna lose experience, we don't. We want to hold on to that for as long as we can because experience is a, goes above and beyond policy and procedure. It goes above and beyond what you're going to learn in the academy. It talks about the application. That's the finesse. That's the art. And that, that's touched on multiple times. Michael Rosenthal says, ignoring the advice of veteran officers and thinking you know more than them. You know, Jason Jarman says something great. Do your checks and get out. Don't hang out with the inmates. Now, for example, guys, you're taking account and I actually saw this when I was out in Indiana at Clark County where they announced 15 minutes, let's get ready to lock it down. And when the officer was doing their final count, that's when the inmates decided that they're going to pray. They're going to do this prayer. Even though they were told prior they had 15 minutes to get ready, when the officer went to go do their count, that's when they decided to do this prayer. And when the officer went to tell them, you know, hey, this got to stop. It's count time now. All of a sudden, this inmate starts to have this interaction of the importance of prayer. And then I see this officer's engaging in this dialogue with this inmate while there's other shit happening on the other two pods. This little chit-chat 
that wind up happening between him and this inmate could have been a distraction. At the end of the day, I got to count. I got to get from A to B. I'm going to get to A and B. You know, if an inmate wants to chit-chat, first off, I'm not one really to chit-chat. I'm going to be quick and to the point. What is it that you need? What is it that you want? What is it that you're trying to get to? Can this wait? Is it emergent? I just want to get from point A to point B. I go down that wing. I'm counting. It's not time to talk. One, two, three. I'm counting all the way down to whatever number I got, and I'm out the wing. If you have something to say, it can wait until I'm done, and you'll come up on my terms, unless it's emergent. I'm just talking about inmates that may just try to talk to you the moment you're doing something. Have you ever dealt with that, guys? When you're in the middle of doing an assignment, even if it's security checks, all of a sudden that's when an inmate tries to chat with you. You ever wonder why they chose that time? Maybe there's something else going on and they're trying to distract you. Don't get caught up. And that's great advice from Jason. <laughs> if you're superstitious, uh, when people say don't say the Q word, I, I agree with that. I think people... They get afraid of the word quiet. And this comes from crisscross applesauce. Never say it's a quiet day. Because usually shit, shit hits the fan. You'll be the one to blame. Never turn your back on an inmate. We know that. Also, with your equipment. Don't leave your equipment all hanging out or unsupervised. Guys, that equipment is your lifeline. That radio, if you have OC, whatever it is that you're allowed to have, keep that on your person. Do not ever leave that unattended or don't just leave it hanging out haphazardly make sure that you treat that with the respect it deserves because i have seen people do the radio scramble many a times because they could have left it at their podium or left it in another unit and now they're scrambling because they don't know where the radio is and there is a horrible feeling when that happens and most people the moment they lose their radio they don't report it right away they scramble because they're worried about covering their own ass and they'll scramble for a good amount of time until they realize, oh man, I can't find my radio. And then they wind up saying, okay, I may have to report this. Well, when did you first lose your radio? About a half an hour ago. And you're reporting it now? So again, keep that radio or whatever your essentials are on your person. Don't leave it haphazardly because these are also tools you're going to need. You're going down a unit and something happens and you don't have your radio. That's going to be a problem. And I know I'm saying radio, but there's other tools, obviously, as well. Don't leave it out in the open, unsupervised. At any time, it can go into the wrong hands. Let's see. You know, touch on again, you know, thinking as a rookie, you know what all that comes from Anthony Ursi. Uh, Jess Krause kind of touches into that, not asking questions, arrogance, making empty promises. Okay, empty promises is unique. Guys, inmates have to trust you, so you do have to be a person of your word. If you say you're going to do something within your prescribed role, you make the effort and you do it. That's the key. Deanna Ross says not paying attention to details. Watch your back. Great advice, Deanna. Also, when it comes to not paying attention to details, a lot of that's going to come with time as well because some of the details you're looking at aren't really surface. It comes with experience. But sometimes also look at yourself. Sometimes we're having an interaction with an inmate and we find ourselves putting our hands in our pocket. I mean, what does that say to the inmate? What does that tell the inmate? That I'm, that I'm okay with this dialogue? That I, you know, I trust you because I have my hands in my pocket? You know, think about that. And what does that say to you, yourself? Like, where am I at right now that I actually think it's okay for me to have my hands in my pocket when I'm talking to an inmate who is a potential threat to my well-being? You know, Jason Pugh touches on keep inmates at the red line at the desk. Remember, inmates are just like you. Be respectful. You know, a lot of places do have that red line, and inmates know they shouldn't cross that. Do not ever allow an inmate to cross that. That is what makes you know if someone goes across that line, that inmate's a threat. And they know that. Inmates are very wary of that line. But the moment you're lax and you allow that first inmate in, other inmates are going to come in. And that's going to be hard for you to determine what's a threat or not. Best thing is, is once that inmate crosses that red line, that inmate is a threat. Because now they broke that space. So they know not to cross that red line. So not only do you want the inmate to understand what that red line means, you yourself need to understand what that red line means. And if you guys don't have it at your location, you guys should definitely talk to your training officers or your supervisors and see if you can get that. Because you definitely need that. That really does help with the spacing. Again, if an inmate comes in and crosses that red line, you know, you're able to defend yourself. 
Uh, Henry says, listen, Henry Laramie says, listen to anything an inmate says without checking, checking it out. Remember, it's easier to turn oh, two vices. And remember, it's easier to turn a no into a yes than a yes into a no. A hundred percent. Obviously, if you make a promise to an inmate and you say yes, it's going to be very hard for you to go back on that word. Where if you say no, you can always go back and say, okay, you know what? I looked into it. I can make that a yes. But he says something right at the beginning that, that hit home with me too. Listen to an, uh, anything an inmate says without checking info out. I always tell people right at, the, right at the very beginning, intel is not easy to handle. It requires a lot to do when someone gives you information. Besides passing it along, you need to know why is that inmate giving you that information? What is their motivation? What's the outcome if you act on that in, uh, information? Is the information valid? So again, you just don't run with everything an inmate says. Check it out. Interrogate the inmate that's giving you the information. Why are you telling me this? What do you hope to gain from it? You know, because again, most of the time they want to see what you do with that information. They want to see you scramble a bit. They want to kind of get an understanding of what you're going to do when they provide information your way. So always check out what's being provided to you and make sure that you test them when they give you information. And, and kind of going back what Henry said when he talked about, remember, it's easier to turn a no into a yes. You can't be in this job if you have the inability to say no. You have to be able to say no because you're going to say no a lot in your career. And the no has to come from you. Not that you have to justify to an inmate why you're saying no, but if you decided to, that inmate better know that you're saying no. Hey, Ganji, can I do this? No. Why? Because I said no. That's it. I said no. I didn't say no because Sergeant Smith is working today and he doesn't tolerate that because that inmate's going to come back to me tomorrow and say, Ganji, why can't I do it today? Because Sergeant Smith's not working. No, no, no. I said no because I said no. That's it. The no, the justification has to be because you believe in the no. Obviously, don't get friendly with inmates. We know that. Never ever tell your personal problems to an inmate or coworker because everybody will know your dirty laundry before the end of your shift. That's great advice. Anything on a personal level. Never share personal information with an inmate. I don't care even if it's something as simple as what your favorite sports team is or what car you drive. If, it, if When an inmate asks me that, I would ask them like, well, what kind of car do you think I drive? Or what kind of sports team do you think I like? Because I want them, I want to know how they know this information if they do know it or why they're even asking me. But at the end of the day, I'm going to cut it down and literally tell them it's none of their business. There's nothing I do at this job that requires me to tell you what my favorite team is. Or what my car is that I drive. My favorite type of car. It's all an effort to pull you out of your prescribed role. However small you think that chatter is, it just provides the inmate with more information. Things that they can utilize. It's like a gateway for more knowledge coming their way. It, again, it's just an effort to pull you out of your prescribed role. There should be no reason why you're telling an inmate that your favorite team is the Giant or that my favorite car is a Dodge. It, it, it just doesn't need to be said. It doesn't relate to your professional dealings with that inmate. Uh, Lauren kind of touches on some of the things we discussed already. Lying to an inmate, not having trust in your word. Remember, guys, you are held at a higher level. Inmates are supposed to trust you knowing that you'll do your job. That comes with that level of consistency. But you're not going to have to trust an inmate. That's not what it's about. But it's about them trusting you. We also talked about, uh, okay, Lauren continues to talk about not providing inmates everything that they were legally entitled to have. If an inmate needed a pair of socks, a meal, or anything else that they were entitled to, that this person made sure that they knew that I would do everything in my power to make sure they got it. Okay, and I agree with that, guys. There are certain things that inmates are entitled to, you know, things to maintain hygiene, clothing, food, whatnot. Now, if by chance you're having a problem getting that, you need to make the effort that you need to make the effort to get it, and you need to document that effort. Because God forbid you have an inmate with that hasn't received hygiene products in a few days or hasn't had a change of clothes in a few days and they start making that complaint to their families or the higher executive positions or even to an ombudsman, it's all going to come back on you. And that's when you're going to go, well, wait a second, I documented this. I called, you know, canteen. I, I, I called clothing. I called to whoever. This is the people I spoke to. I even told my supervisor. I haven't gotten anything. Trust and believe when you start holding people responsible, you will get things. But if you're just generally making the attempt, when shit hits the fan, they're going to come at you. You know, and you're the first person they're going to say, well, did you do your job? This is your, this is your responsibility. How long has the inmate been in your unit? And how long have they been wearing the same clothes? Okay. 
check my logbook. I've discussed this issue. I brought it to my supervisors. I did what I had to do. Document. Tiana Light LaJoy says, walking next to an inmate, never walk in front of an inmate. Talking about personal things, which we talked about. Um, also, never talk to an inmate about concerns you're having with your peers at the job. Because that is very divisive. That gives an inmate a chance to employ the us versus them tactic or the we versus they. You know, they're trying to separate the two and they could pull you guys into each other's group. So basically, I have a problem with, let's say, Officer Russ Hamilton. So the inmates, let's say they hear about it, or because maybe I'm foolish enough to tell an inmate, or it's become evident on the unit. Now they'll do whatever they can to feed that divide. Trust and believe that. It's an effort to pull you closer to them. And next thing you know, you don't have the support of your peers. So whatever you got to do, work it out with that officer, work it out with that peer. Do not make anything evident to those inmates on that unit. It's an open, open target right on your back. Trust me. See it all the time. Ricardo kind of touches on not reporting uh, VIA documentation. You know, guys, sometimes reporting things are obvious, you know, the emergent stuff, but sometimes it's not so obvious. And you need to cover your back, even if it's not the most popular choice. I'll give you a story that someone told me a while back, which they thought was not the biggest thing, but it, I thought it was actually a lot bigger than the person thought it was because they actually got in trouble for it. So they had an officer, uh, this officer that called me had an officer that would always break in their unit, which wasn't the designated area. But this officer liked to break in this unit and he would tell the uh, newer boot, hey, don't worry about writing me in. I'm only taking a break. I'm just chilling here. I'm not doing anything official. So the officer, trusting the senior officer, didn't put him in the book. Eventually, that senior officer got himself in trouble. Got himself in trouble. And when they did the investigations, they saw that that officer was constantly in that unit. And they went to that rookie officer to say, how come you never documented that officer in that unit? And that rookie officer took some days. That rookie officer got hit with some days. Obviously, the rookie officer wasn't doing nothing wrong. He just foolishly trusted that officer enough where he didn't put that person in the logbook. Don't do that, guys. You will be held responsible. If that officer comes in unit, it's never gonna be off the record. You know, it's never gonna be off the record. And I don't know if that's an unpopular thing right now, what I'm telling you, but guys, you know it to be true. Trust and believe what I'm telling you is true. Matthew kind of touched on what we just talked about before, keeping my hands out of, his po out of, out of my pockets. Cody talked about something with female officers. So if you're a female, don't use that or flirting with inmates or fellow staff. Don't use that as means of power, persuasion, or as an avenue to be liked. Know your authority, know your place, know the rules, keep it respectful, and don't cross the line. What you do, it's a slippery slope, and respect is everything. I agree with that 100%. Me, my channel's advocate. We advocate for females in corrections, especially working with males. We believe that there's a balance there that's needed, um, but it's still a struggle, still a fight. But having said that, don't try to use maybe your good looks or something to gain favor with the supervisor. Earn it through your work ethic. Do the right thing. I think that's great advice from Cody. And it continues with that respect that the female officers do deserve. Again, it's a struggle for them. So we don't want to set them back because... There's still controversy about females working in male facilities, just the same as males working in female facilities. I believe there's a balance. I believe we're professional. I believe that we could work whatever the gender, as long as we remain respectful, and I believe that we balance each other's strengths and weaknesses. But, again, it's still a struggle. But definitely a very good tip from Cody Ann Cook. Uh, let's see... Let's see, let's skip a little further down. Obviously never bring in contraband, we know that. Let's see. You know, Donnie, uh, Denny touched on the same thing. Danny Lewis said, making a promise or telling an inmate something you would do for them and not follow through. Again, within your prescribed role. Be careful who you trust. We talked about knowing how you say no, know how to say no, and remain firm, fair, and consistent. And the key with that, guys, is remaining firm, fair, and consistent with yourself first and then that will automatically carry out to how you deal with the population but it's not even just 
about remaining firm, free, and consistent with the MA population eventually. It's also with each other. My coworker says no and the no is valid. Don't come to me for a yes. You know, I'm not daddy because mommy said no. Inmates will play that out all day. And eventually the your peers, the ones that are saying no and you're foolish enough to say yes, they're watching you as you lose total control of your unit. And they have no respect for you because they've been saying no and here you are continuing to say yes. Don't do that. Not only be firm, fair, and consistent with yourself, with the MA population, but with each other, with your supervisors, as well as your supervisors should be consistent with you, with the different shifts. Don't give inmates any way to maneuver. Uh, Demas Dino Morales touches on something pretty good as well. Not writing everything down in the logbook, we discussed that, as well as keep personal logbook on you at all times, which I, I agree with that. You know, a lot of people do keep a little personal notebook that says exactly what post they had, the interactions outside of the one logbook, and that's more for them. That's a CYA for them. So if something happens, they say, well, I didn't work that day, or that was the post I had that day. Because again, not, not everything may be in that logbook. So, you know, someone can say, well, you're supposed to work this post all day. So were you there for 12 days? No, actually, um, I was relieved by a GA at this time, and I was actually sent on an outside trip. So I wasn't there for those hours. So that personal law book really does matter. There's a lot that you can record that you keep on your person. I think that's great advice. Uh, Demas Dino Morales also says, memorize all the radio calls, sign, and always know where you're at. West Wing, East, North, etc. I agree. Me and Russ discussed this a while back about the layout. One of the first things you should remember when working in a prison is the layout of the facility. Try to memorize that map as best as possible. Uh, try to you know, take tours with senior staff so they can show you the layout because if, God forbid, something ever happens, you know exactly where you're at. But on the adverse of that, if you have to run to a code, you know exactly where to run to. So make that a priority when you enter this profession. Understand the layout of the facility and also recognize the codes. Know what each code means. But that's great advice uh, from Demas Dino Morales. Uh, we talked about what Jason Wolf said. We talked about not learning how to say no or not backing your coworkers when they do. We just kind of discussed that prior, but that's true. Your coworker says no, and it's a valid no. Don't be that person where the inmates can get a yes from. Don't start that. That's a train wreck. John DeMarco says walking in front of inmates. We know about that. Um, let's see. Joe Roberts mentioned something that's actually pretty interesting. He made the mistake once of taking an ag seg inmate to medical and then leaving him alone with the nurse. He got chewed out, but he said this is a pro tip. If you're escorting an inmate, you stay with that inmate, period. You know what's funny? You never really know what's an issue until someone brings it up. So thank you for bringing that up, Joe, because I would think that's just 101. But you know what, man? You never know. I think that's very valuable advice. Definitely a pro tip. Guys, if you're on the escort, maintain that escort. Don't leave that inmate unattended. <laughs> Matt, Finlayson, Matt Finlayson says, show up to work. Of course, that's the first sign of dependability. Show up to work. Build that trust. And remember, build that trust. You don't come in automatically with that trust. So one of the ways to build that trust, to be dependable, is showing up to work. Showing up when you're needed. Supervisors should respect that. Uh, Kevin Williams says, don't try to be nice to everyone or... Don't worry about offending people sometimes, especially inmates, or worse, trying to be everyone's friend. I agree. This job, you're not going to be seen as a nice person all the time, and that's okay. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to do a job. John Reynolds says some really good advice. Some have family that work in corrections, and they were told things despite what your family told you. You must listen and learn for yourself. Can't come in day one with 20 years of experience. That's powerful. That's powerful. You may know a lot of people that work in this profession but they may have had their dealings with individuals. And they may come and tell you that these are who these people are. Wait until you have that dealing. Because sometimes those dealings are really just based on a perspective. I have worked with people and had a great report of people that other people thought were just not good people to work with. And it's amazing because I've never had a negative interaction. So I developed my own opinion. So that, that, that was great advice by John. Wayne Sanderson says, opening your mouth to say much more than your name. Yes, no and lock in for the first year when you should be listening. So basically just listen. That's what you should do. Just listen. Take advice, don't say more than necessary. Jim Carpenter says miscalculation of time to serve and releasing an inmate without verifying identity or active warrants. So obviously I believe he, he may work in a jail or a prison, maybe some of the, with um, 
dealing with the classification process. So yes, if you're in the classification, make sure you get those calculations right. Check, recheck, check again. You know, and then for custody and whoever does the the uh, identification, there's a lot of mistakes made with identifying inmates. And the funny thing is, when it comes to identifying inmates, there should be multiple checkpoints where those inmates are identified. So when an inmate does get released, they should have been through like six or seven checkpoints, including the final, maybe like a lieutenant or something, some high-level supervisor that has to check that inmate out before they leave. But, um, you know, go above and beyond when it comes to checking that. Above and beyond. Don't be rushed to do it. Raymond Ballister says, trying to do what a veteran officer does. And I, and I agree with that. I'm going to comment. Let me just finish the rest of his comment. But, but there's something there with that. Thanks, Ray. And you must earn the respect. Oh, and keep your hands out of your pocket. By the time you react, you'll be on the ground fighting for your life. Um, obviously, we talked about earning respect. We just said that. You can't come to this profession thinking that you're going to have the respect of, your, of the experienced officers that are already there or the experienced staff members. You have to earn that. You know, this profession, we, we don't easily trust people. So when you come in, you have to earn that. That respect is earned. But he says trying to do what a veteran officer does. I agree. You're going to learn a lot from veteran officers, but there's a certain way of things that they do that does come from experience and also dealing with the inmate population. This is your time to be an apprentice to the profession. So learn. But don't think that automatically they're going to teach you this and you're going to be able to hop in their shoes and do what they do. Some of that stuff that they teach you is going to be years of experience that you have to cross yourself into. It's like what we call checking the temperature. You know, so that's 100% accurate. You know, learn what you can, but again, this is a job that takes time. So don't expect to be able to do all these things overnight. Be the apprentice. Take many years to learn everything that you can. And then eventually, then you can try to start saying, okay, well, you know what? I'm ready for this next step. But in the meantime, this is your time to learn. This isn't your time to showcase your abilities. This is your time to learn and take things in and then develop eventually who you're going to be. Uh, never leave your personal stuff out. We know that. Let's see. There's a conversation here with Marilyn and Wayne where Marilyn says, tell your whole day room when they're pissed off that you have enough handcuffs and cells to lock them all up in ag seg. And then Wayne tells Marilyn back, I recall a new boot, a sergeant at a certain facility in 1995 ending mess and when the inmates didn't get up and leave telling the entire chow hall that if they didn't dump and run immediately then their next tray would be in lockup we made jokes about him calling for 50 pairs of cuff and 100 feet of chain for months so she came back and said i was brand spanking new and obviously stupid and did this <laughs> my field training officer was like no 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 we don't i was like well don't say that again and then she goes, there's no better experience than learning it in the moment, right? And that's great. And thank you for sharing that story, Marilyn, because uh, we learn a lot from, you know, some of the mistakes that others make. But uh, I think that's a great and very interesting. I'm sure it's, it's, it's funny now, but it probably wasn't funny then. Uh, Joe Papano says, always have a way out or rolling doors to cells with your rover at the end of the run. That's good advice. Steve Terrell says, handing the keys to an inmate to open the door for a sergeant. I hope we never do that guys never give your keys over to an inmate obviously things are set here because they probably happened so john says a joke just don't take the job come on john you're an advocate for this profession he doesn't mean that um joe touched on what we touched on before too joe pompano talks about leaving your keys or radio somewhere where a convict can get his hands on it uh, Mark Ballas compliments what we talked about about being humble to senior staff. Never ever say I know to a veteran officer trying to give you advice. He also says, remember, if you're on time, you're late. Don't be the guy who shows straight up. Relieve your fellow officers before they freeze the gates. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Mark. Also, I know we don't have shift briefings at a lot of places or what they call um, daily briefings where you get to, you know, like an overlap. But I still think that it is in our best interest to come in a few minutes early to get that change, that exchange of information. I know it's tough to say because people want that overtime. Um, but you need to know what's happening in your unit. So if you're coming in exactly at that minute and you're expecting that other person to stay and tell you the information, that's unfair. You know, at least for the time. Hopefully they, they give us back the roll call or shift briefing, whatever you guys call it because we definitely do need it. That overlap, it's, it's, it maybe it's, it's a small amount of money compared to the knowledge that you're going to get. They should have never gotten rid of that. 
Uh, let's see. Don't be someone you're not. Listen and thank people for their help, even if you know what you're doing. Five and a half years in, and I always thank people for their willingness to help me. That's great advice by uh, C. Ray. Coming to an end here, guys. Randy Bullinger says, believe in the lines. All the other COs let me do it. Or policy states you have to. It's better to say no and have to go back and say yes than to say yes and then have to go back and say no. I agree. A lot of inmates, what they'll do to try to motivate a yes from you is when they ask you to do something foolish, you know, and you say no, they'll say, well, such and such told me or such and such allows us to do it. And they're playing a the game. They're trying to pull someone that you're connected to to motivate the yes. And obviously you shut that down. Again, if you're unsure of something, say no. And the, the no could always become a yes later on. Corey Lee says something great. Don't fuck up the count. Don't fuck up the count. That's true, guys. Counts are essential. Um, don't walk through the staff doors with your gun still in your holster. Guys, obviously when people share this, it's happened. Uh, even people from the security field. Brandy Lee Lewanski says, I'm in the security field. However, I believe this helps me out as well. Always know your location. Know all exit points and never have your back to the door. Let's see. Some guy watched, Rat Sean watched a, a female officer show inmates her tattoos. Share nothing. Joshua Grigsby says something that we could explore later on. Believing your supervisors have your back. And it's true. Sometimes you have supervisors or leaders. They'll have your back. Leaders will have your back. Most supervisors. And it depends. You know, but again, we don't want to have generalized animosity. Well, because we have one bad supervisor doesn't mean every supervisor is bad. Well, because we have one bad administration doesn't, administrator doesn't mean all administration is bad. So believing your supervisors have your back could be specific to a certain issue with somebody. But having said that, that's advice that I don't want you to ignore either. Do your job, document, you know, protect yourself. Uh, great advice from Tania Miller. Never get complacent. Come to work, do your job every day. No slacking. John Wick even mentioned something about giving inmates the keys. Trust me, he's seen it happen. It's the second time we heard that just now. Rich Sullivan says, biggest mistake is walking in the door acting like an, enti like, acting like an entitled know-it-all that won't listen or take some direction from a senior officer. Also thinking the academy is the end-all, be-all on the job. And guys, I got two more comments left, but the funny thing is the academy too can sometimes be responsible for that. Sometimes the academy preaches how the knowledge has changed. What they're giving now is a lot better than what it was back in the day. And what you don't realize is you're making the senior staff look inferior to the knowledge that's being provided. Don't do that. Try to do what you can to, yes, give the trainee uh, some great training, but don't put them on a pedestal where they feel that they're better than the seniors that have walked the walk. All right, and the last statement is going to be from Hugh Wrinkle. I don't know if it's been said, but don't forget that inmates are people too. And if you treat them with a little bit of respect, it can improve how well your housing unit runs. And that's great advice from Hugh Wrinkle. So, guys, this is just some advice to pass your way. Some great comments from experience. I didn't have this when I was coming into the profession. So listen to this advice. There's a lot here. Share it. It's good knowledge. Ultimately, you share the knowledge that's provided to the people that are coming in and knew the job. It can only make this place that you work safer and more secured. As always, guys, if you like what I'm giving you, please hit the like. Don't forget to subscribe, interact, engage, and comment. And as always, guys, stay safe. Whoa.